as I call them, have been able to orchestrate the major events and therefore the direction of the world on a global scale and a scale that beggars belief. What I've already said is staggering to the perception of life that most people have, that we're encouraged to have, that we are programmed to have. And I feel, I feel a bit like, uh, like the cow who walks in the field and you've got the herd of cows in the field there and they're munching away and their reality is that every now and again the big truck comes and it takes a few of them away and wherever they think they go, I don't know, another field, on holiday, whatever. And then this other cow comes into the field and says, hey, hey, you've you got to listen. Oh, you, you, you won't believe what I've just found out. You, you know when they put them, oh, those cows and some of us in that, in that truck and they take us away every, every now and again? Um, they're not taking us to another field or on vacation. Uh, what they do is they take you down to this, this big building and they slit their throats and they bleed them dry and then they cut them up and they hang them on hooks and then they put them in little packages and, and put it in the supermarket and then them humans come along and buy us and eat us? What would be the reaction of the rest of the herd on hearing this information? You're crazy, man. You're out of your brain. You want to go and see a psychiatrist? They'd never do that. This is ridiculous. And anyway, I've got shares in that trucking company and I get, get a good return. Shut up, you're making waves. And yet, all the things that I have just said are absolutely true. It's just that the herd will not believe them. And what's happening now as we unfold across the millennium and beyond and the perception of life dramatically changes, what in the past would have been considered Ridiculous, extreme, a nonsense is increasingly through documented evidence, not from some theory, being confirmed as true. A very, very few people run this planet and control your life, and yet you have the power to control your life. You just give it away. And that's the point. When, when I talk about a, a few people running the world, um, understandably, people come back and they say, well, it's not possible, mate. Can't be done. Too many people. And it can't be done by physical means, by soldiers at the door and soldiers in the street. You can do that in a small area, but you cannot control billions of people physically, just like you can't control a herd of sheep or a herd of pigs physically if they don't want to be controlled. In England, uh, a little while ago, we had a remarkable example of that, in the sense that uh, two pigs um, actually escaped from a slaughterhouse. They were just about to go through all that stuff I've just been talking about. And they got away. What they said was, <laughs> instead of just following the herd and just accepting that that's what you do, they thought for themselves, they expressed their uniqueness, they broke out of the herd. And they ran away. And this became a major national news story day after day after day because all these different people and agencies were dispatched to, to catch the two pigs and they couldn't catch them for days and days and days because they were trying to catch them physically. And because those pigs expressed their uniqueness, far from going to the slaughterhouse, they became national celebrities and are now wheeled out at galas and fates and, and other events as one of the star attractions. Sh shows what you can do when you express your uniqueness instead of following the herd. The point I'm making here, however, is that you can't control lots of people physically but you don't have to. What you do is you manipulate the way they think and the way they feel so they behave in the way you want them to. Mind and emotional manipulation. Uh, summed up and symbolized uh, by this. We are multidimensional infinity. We're not just a, a physical body. As we'll come to in the second of these two videos, we are everything that exists. But how much of everything that exists, the eternal consciousness, are we accessing? Infinity or just a fraction? 
And the difference between that infinity perception of life and possibility and that is simply, again, beyond words to describe. So the idea has been, over thousands of years of this manipulation, to turn unique aspects of infinity into a tiny, tiny eggshell of consciousness with a tiny, tiny perception of its own potential to control its own destiny. And once you do that, you create the herd mentality. And the herd mentality uh, can be summed up by what we see all the time um, in a herd or a flock, whatever you want to call it, of sheep. If you look at how uh, sheep are controlled all over the planet every day, it's through this. It's because sheep are put in that symbolic eggshell so that they don't think for themselves, they just follow the one in front. So, most of the sheep every day, and I've seen it, remarkable sight it is, where the farmer arrives with the sheepdog, and there's this whole kind of group of sheep, hundreds of them in the example that I saw once in England. And they're all munching away and no problem. And then suddenly, when the farmer arrives, one or two of them start to walk. Just one or two. Ba, 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 ba. And it's like flipping Exodus. Hundreds of them just follow the one in front without thinking. No, well, do I want to follow the one in front? You know, what do I feel today? Maybe I want to go over there. No, no, ba, 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 ba. And then you've got the tiny few who don't immediately succumb to that and follow that and concede their uniqueness to that and they're given the extra dose of fear by the sheepdog right 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 oh all right then and that four letter word fear is what controls the world fear fear the manipulation of fear so what you have are two states of being that get hundreds of sheep exactly where the farmer and the sheepdog want every day and those two states of being are ba 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 and fear, which gets the few to do the same. Staggeringly, we may find watching a group of sheep like that funny. Oh, come on, Ethel, come and look at these sheep. They're so stupid. And yet, the human herd, because that's what we've become, has out sheep the sheep. Because we have actually dispensed with the sheepdog. We police each other. It has become a crime to be different. Anyone who's different from the norm gets ridicule or condemnation. Instead of expressing uh, and welcoming and encouraging and glorying in the unique contributions we all have to make, we condemn them or ridicule them. Now this is not just naval contemplating. It is fundamental to how a few have controlled the world for literally thousands of years. And unless we break this, they'll go on doing it. What it means is that all you have to do to control the direction of the world and control literally billions of people is to set the norms in society. What is considered right and wrong, moral or immoral, sane or insane, possible or impossible. And once you set those norms by controlling the education system, crikey, education system, crikey, what a word. With some, you know, so, someone said, um, was Gandhi, was asked what he thought of Western civilization, and he said, I think it would be a very good idea. What do I think of education? I think it would be a very good idea. I think it's about time we had some. So through controlling the education system, the mantra messages through the media, confirming that these norms are how life is, the vast majority of people in the human herd, from cradle to grave, occupy those norms and live their lives within them because they think that's reality. Now that's fine, that's a choice, I don't have a problem with that. But we seem to find it so hard to make those choices and let other people make different choices. So the reason the few can control the world as they do and have for so long is not just that vast numbers of people live within the norms, 
It's that those people insist those people that want to live outside the norms conform as well. So the key state of being, which is the foundation of all that I'm talking about, is the one you'll find in the vast, overwhelming majority, all but a handful, literally, of human beings. It's the fear of what other people think of them. Once you're in that mode, and that's the eggshell, then you're in trouble. Because suddenly you're not living your life, you're not expressing your uniqueness, you're living someone else's version of what you should be. You're already in prison, you're in what I call the hassle-free zone of norms, you've conceded what you are to what someone says you should be. And if enough people do that, and we, we do, whoever sets the norms runs the world. And what happens then, uh, of course, is that when you're on the edge of that hassle-free zone and you're thinking, shall I, shan't I express my uniqueness? Shall I go with what my heart's telling me? What is, what is, what is the fear at that point that is making us resist? Oh, should I, shouldn't I? We're not at that point thinking, uh, what will the President of the United States think if I express my uniqueness? What will the Pope think? Although some people will do that, my goodness me, why I don't know, but they do. Or what will the governor of the Bank of England or the head of the Federal Reserve think? No, no. What's making us resist expressing our uniqueness is our fear of what our mother will think. Oh my God, what will my mother say? What will the guys down the bar say or the people at work? In other words, the people's reaction that keeps us in those norms are the people who are already in there. So the sheep have also become the sheepdog. The police have also become the police. The inmates of the prison are also the prison warders. Now this combination, I repeat because it is so important, this combination means that whoever sets the norms in society runs the world. If, and the big, big if, if we concede our uniqueness to it and insist that everyone else does the same. And then when the norms are set, different aspects of the herd are played off against each other. So religions have been created, and we'll get into that because it's remarkable how the religions which fight each other and conflict with each other actually come down to the same people. Same story, too, when you look into it. So they play different aspects of the herd off against each other. Religion is played off against religion. Political party is played against political party. Economic theory against economic theory. And so we've set the norms that have created the herd, and then the herd is set at war with itself. And while we're cussing each other and fighting each other and blaming each other, the few people are string pulling all these different elements and creating the key, the key element that's necessary for the few to control the many, divide and rule. So when I'm going through this story, I'm not kind of getting into, and I don't want to get into, it's them, them. What I'm talking about here is because of us. Without us, none of this stuff will be possible, which is great news because we can uncreate it in the period we're going through now. Just say one other thing before I move on about this. You know, most of the things, most of the belief systems, because that's what it is, belief, 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 that are played off against each other, that conflict with each other and fight with each other, they're actually just the same state of being with a different name. I wonder what the difference is between, say, a Christian family that insists that their children believe what they believe and a Jewish family that insists their children believe what they believe. What's the difference? It's just that they believe slightly different things, and they are slightly, but they're still indoctrinating their children into a belief instead of saying, you have all the information available and we encourage it. And whatever you come up with, whatever you make of that information, I'm at peace with because you're unique and I'm not going to tell you what to think. So if we want to be free, 
we have to start by setting ourselves free and setting other people free, not least our children, to be who they really are and not what we'd like them to be. And what, what I call these opposites that are not opposites, I call them oppo-sames. And it's amazing when you look around the different groups that are fighting and conflicting, when you look at the core of what they're saying and they believe and their actions and their ways of acting, you're not looking at opposites at all. You're looking at the same state of mind with a different dress on. I'll give you a quick example. Um, during the last war, the World War, Second World War, the far, 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 far left, as symbolized by Joseph Stalin, communism, was played off against the opposite. The far, 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 far right, symbolized by Adolf Hitler, the Nazis. Now, they had to be opposites because we're told they are. That's the left, that's the right. Wow, let's have a look at them. Let's just check this one out. The far, 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 far left, as symbolized by Joseph Stalin, was into centralized control, military dictatorship, and concentration camps. Now, the far, 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 far right must have been very different because they're opposites. I read it somewhere. The far, far right are into centralized control, military dictatorship, and concentration camps. And they were played off against each other. They're not opposites, they're oppositions. One thing I think we need to remember all the time, opposites never fight. They never take part in wars, because the opposite of a state of mind that believes that war is an option and conflict is an option and violence is an option is the state of mind that says it's never an option, because violence and war and conflict never solve anything. That never fights that because that doesn't want to know. What fights wars? Two aspects of the same state of being. So the elements of society that create the divide and rule are not even different states of mind. They're the same state of mind um, with a slightly different name. Now going on from this imprisoning uh, of the consciousness into what I call the eggshell goes something else very important. But this is the structure that has allowed this control by the few of the many to go on throughout this period I'm talking about. Because if you're going to uh, hold people in that eggshell of perception and thought and possibility, you have to keep from them vast amounts of information that would set them free. Set them free to understand that the world is being controlled in the first place and also set them free from their own sense of limitation. So throughout this period of time, uh, the same structure can be seen, and it can be symbolized, as you see here, by a pyramid. You've got a tiny, tiny few people at the top of the pyramid who hoard the really advanced knowledge, the knowledge that would set us free if we had access to it. And the rest of the pyramid is fiercely compartmentalized. So the further you come down into the mass of the people, the less that knowledge is in circulation, until you reach the point where it's hardly in circulation at all. And this structure of knowledge in the hands of the few and the masses kept in ignorance is one that goes on again and again and again. And without it, frankly, this manipulation simply couldn't happen. And the world would not be as it currently is and has been for thousands of years. And the nature of some of this information, um, years ago, as we'll come to as we tell the chronological story in a second, maps of the world existed, which... Uh, for instance, the ancients knew that the American continent was there. Um, the idea that Christopher Columbus was the first European to discover the American continent, I mean, it's just ludicrous. I've just seen a pig fly across here for a start. I mean, it's just crazy on basic evidence. Um, and if you had maps of the world and the mass of the people didn't know they existed, that again gives you a significant knowledge which most people don't have. But now we're in the what you might call the modern world. We're in a situation where fantastic technology exists outside the public arena, which we don't know about. And if we did, it would be a very different world. Um, a little while ago, I, I, when I started to get a bit of a profile in this information, I was invited to a meeting with a guy in America who works uh, for the CIA as a scientist against his will. And he told me of the amazing technology that has not just uh, been available more recently, it's been available for decades. Technology that would create abundant growth in deserts without water, end of famine in Ethiopia and other places in the world. That would um, give us all the power and warmth we need in our homes, in our businesses, in our factories without using 
polluting fossil fuels and these other sources which are doing such damage to the planet. Technology which could cure cancer and so-called incurable diseases exists now. Why don't we have it? Because it would set us free, it would give us choice, and choice equals freedom. Lack of choice equals uh, the opposite of freedom, the imprisoning eggshell that I'm talking about. So it's kept from us. And I asked this guy, just to give you an idea of what's going on the other side of the movie screen that's projected at us via the media and education and what we laughingly call that. I said to him the obvious question, if you don't like doing all this, why do you work for the CIA against your will? And he opened his shirt and he said, this is why. And it was a kind of a bizarre moment because on one area of the room, there was his children and his family. And yet I was looking at this father from this bizarre perspective of the world he lives in when he goes out the door in the morning. On his chest was a see-through sachet, or patch as they call them, um, in the trade. And in it was this golden liquid, which turns out to be a drug. And he went into work one day, because just because you work for the CIA or the FBI doesn't mean you, you want to control the world and unfold all this stuff I'm going to come to. Most people think they're serving their country. Why? Because they're down here in the pyramid. He went in to work one day, and he has missing time he still can't account for. He remembers just waking up, however, in this room. And when he woke up, he realized this patch was there. And the reason it was there was this. His body had been manipulated to uh, need that drug to survive. And if the drug is not replaced, and the patch has to be replaced every 72 hours, he starts to die. And after one incident, when he said no more, they did that. And this is just one of countless people all over the world who are geniuses in their area that could use that genius to set the world free who in fact um, use it because of this situation to further imprison the world and deny us the knowledge of the existence of these technologies while the very same technologies are used against us to further to increase the control because of course knowledge is neutral technology is neutral it's how you use it that is positive or negative and is either freeing or imprisoning. So I got to the point, particularly in a book called And the Truth Shall Set You Free, where I, in very great detail, highlighted the structure of how the world is controlled today. And later on in this two video series, um, I'll get into that. But then you, th you look at it and you look at the scale of the structure and the detail of it and the way it works and the way all these different apparently unconnected institutions are actually connected and you say, well, this could not have been put together in a few weeks, a few years, a few decades. So when did this thing start? And you go back, you go back. I got it comfortably to the time of the Crusades and the period that a lot of so-called knights organizations appeared. Um, around the 1100s, 1200s, that kind of period, and uh, into the 1300s. Very comfortably back then. Keep going back, keep going back. And eventually you're into thousands of years BC before you can pick up the thread of where this thing came from. And then you start to look at some of the great mysteries of the ancient world and ask a few questions because conventional history says that we are at this time at the cutting edge of human knowledge. There was never any society or civilization in the past, or what we call the past, that was here or in advance of here. And in fact, the ancients were like primitive and didn't know much. Well, who built these then? The pyramids at Giza and some of the other great structures of the ancient world, which are mathematically geometrically perfection. Who built them? Bill and Ethel in the tent? I mean, who did it? Um, then you look at some of the other. This, this is Easter Island. I'm sure I know someone looks like that. I'm sure I know someone that was designed on. But this is, again, thousands of years ago. And them hats there are apparently ten tons. Be interesting, wouldn't it? 
How did they get them up there? You know, you imagine it, can't you? Come on, Bill, Bill, bit more, left, right. Was done by high intelligence. No one knows where they came from. All the pyramids. Look at this, this is in Peru. Now, this has been done by an axe and chisel, isn't it? Look at the perfection of the way that stone is fitted into the rest. Can't hardly get a piece of paper between it. Thousands of years ago, this was done by a primitive people. Oh, I. Places full of pigs flying. Look at the size of this in Peru. You know, again, all right, Bill, a bit heavier this time, to the left. Fantastic knowledge created these things in the ancient world. This uh, stone there in the center is one of three weighing 800 tons called the Trilithon in a place called Baalbek, what we now call the Lebanon. Thousands of years BC, that was built. And those 800 ton blocks had to be moved at least a third of a mile. Primitives did that. I read it somewhere. Must be true. He had letters after his name, the guy that said it. This is um, the Nazca lines in Peru again, on the Nazca plains. There you have a situation where um, in the ancient world they scored away the top surface to reveal the, the white underneath. And s amazing depictions of birds, insects and animals were created in this way. And some of them were only discovered in terms of what they were when we rediscovered, and I emphasize the re, rediscovered out of fly in this century. Because some of these things can only be seen from a thousand feet, apparently. So there's a, a bird and his uh, uh, spider. Again, the Nazca lines. How did they do that, these primitive people all over the world? Because they were not primitive. In the sense that there was a group within ancient society that had amazingly advanced knowledge. And that's the knowledge that's been hoarded and passed over to the few into the modern world that is still used to control us and always has been used to control us. And um, it's amazing. Um, the, you know, people talk about prophecy. Well, um, here's a confirmation that prophecy is absolutely fact and not some myth. Uh, on an ancient hillside, or not an ancient hillside, but a hillside with an ancient depiction of something on it in Devon, in England, um, here's an incredible prophecy of um, thousands of years later, the arrival on earth of Bill Clinton. Um, Bill comes into this um, in many ways. Oh, sorry, my eyes are watering. It's all right. Cameron's looking a bit pale as well. But Bill Clinton, again, President of the United States, as we'll see, all this stuff about, you know, Monica Lewinsky and all that stuff is actually obscuring what Bill Clinton's really involved in and what he's really connected to. Because again, we're watching day after day a smokescreen and an illusion behind which the truth is. So, in the ancient world, there were people with fantastic knowledge. Where did that knowledge come from? I put this picture up just to... Uh, emphasize the nonsense of how the idea that extraterrestrial life doesn't exist, how ridiculous it is. There are billions of stars in this universe. It's apparently estimated, I was reading, a billion in this galaxy. How many galaxies in the universe? That's just the physical universe. What about all the other um, parallel universes? What we call creation is alive with life. And yet, it's become, it's become a situation where you're ridiculed if you talk about extraterrestrial life over the years. You know, you get people saying, hey, he thinks there's other life in the universe more intelligent than me, you know. And you think, darling, I've seen a cup of coffee more intelligent than you. But th the point being that to say that in this amazing mass of life in this galaxy alone that life as we know it has only evolved on this one tiny little planet in this one solar system that's credible Ooh, oh yeah scientists say that and yet to say there must be life elsewhere on the law of averages alone is to be always oh, a bit strange he believes in extraterrestrials 
But when you look dispassionately at the evidence, and that's the point, if you come into this stuff with a belief to defend, might as well go and watch the prices right. Because the belief will defend itself. If we let the information uh, lead us rather than the preconceived idea, it takes us into some very interesting areas. First of all, when you look at ancient texts and traditions um, all over the world, literally all over the world, you find very clear um, descriptions of an advanced race or races that we would call extraterrestrial, not of this planet, that came to this planet and brought this advanced knowledge um, a long, long time ago. Some of the most famous um, examples of this are what have become known as the Sumerian texts or tablets. They were found in uh, what we now call Iraq um, in the last century, about 1850, thousands of them. And they've been translated by a number of people, most famously a guy called Zachariah Sitchin. People think he's the only one that's done it because of the publicity and stuff that he's got in his books, but many other people have done it. And I've actually have come to a slightly different interpretation than him, but the common theme of all of them is this, that a group which the Sumerian tablets, uh, which were uh, buried around 2000 BC, something like that, that the, they talk about this group they call the Anunnaki in Sumerian, those who from heaven to earth uh, came, which is the, the basic translation, but those who came from the high place and down to the earth um, overall is the, the feel of it, the Anunnaki. And when it talks about these Anunnaki and the tablets and stuff, and here's an example of just, just one of the uh, so-called cylinder seals that were found um, among them depicting various things. Um, there are some remarkable uh, points and areas of text and evidence that you can see. First of all, there is remarkable knowledge in these texts of planetary, solar system, uh, universal, ast astronomical uh, knowledge that has only been confirmed in this century and sometimes even more recently. In the uh, text, for instance, they describe what Uranus and Neptune look like in a way that's only been confirmed in literally the last few years. They depict the solar system with planets that have only been found in the last century and the 20th century. How did they do that? What they say is the knowledge was brought by this Anunnaki. But it's more than that because it talks in some detail about how this Anunnaki interbred with humanity, creating a hybrid race. And you find this theme all over the world. Uh, you find it in Genesis, in the Bible, which is a rewrite, when you do the research, of the Sumerian stories. So we get the, the theme of the sons of God, who interbred with the daughters of men. But when you take that back to the Hebrew, just one step, you find that that phrase, sons of God interbred with the daughters of men, actually says sons of the gods interbred with the daughters of men. And every time in the Old Testament you see the word God, it's translated from a word meaning gods. And it's clear to me that we have been misled and we've misunderstood the difference between the gods, symbolically extraterrestrials in the ancient world, and God, which is all consciousness, all energy, everything that exists. So these Sumerian tablets um, very much confirm this, this ancient race. Now, again, when you look at other cultures, you find the same stories in the ancient Hindu cultures, the Veda. Uh, the Vedas, their ancient holy books, you find um, descriptions of the gods flying in flying machines, which we would call uh, aeroplanes or um, UFOs or flying saucers, whatever. And when you take the common theme around the world, it's very clear that in the ancient world was a race or races of very, very high technological knowledge. And this was the knowledge that built the pyramids. This was the knowledge that built all those ancient structures which conventional history and archaeology simply cannot explain. Now, this area um, here of what we call the asteroid belt would seem to be very, very significant. If you take Zachariah Sitchin's um, translation of the Sumerian tablets, 
Um, the detail of which I have a problem with, I must say, um, here and there. Um, they talk about, according to his translation, that a planet called Nibiru, the planet of the crossing in his translation of the Sumerian, uh, came into this solar system uh, a vast, vast amount of time ago. And one of its moons collided with a planet that was between Jupiter and Mars, and that created the asteroid belt, which just happens to be between Jupiter and Mars. That's one interpretation of what happened, but there are others. And I've come across um, uh, a scientist a friend in America who's been researching all this for 30 years, and um, he uh, is convinced from a, a large amount of different evidence that actually something different happened, um, not least because at a major corporation he used to work for, they did a study, the physicists at that corporation, into what must have happened to the solar system. Because when you look at the planets and how they spin and how fast they spin and all this stuff, it's very clear that some major, major disruption has happened in this solar system. It's affected not just the Earth, but also um, the other planets. It's a major cataclysm. And they came to the conclusion, which basically supports the theme of a guy called Emmanuel Velikovsky, um, in the 50s, it was ridiculed for saying that um, what we now call Venus went through this solar system, devastated Mars, and almost destroyed the Earth. But these physicists um, are actually supporting the basis of that. What they believe as a result of their research is that the planet we now call Jupiter came into this solar system not that long ago, remarkably. 7,000 years ago, maybe, something like that. 4,800 B.C. was the... Uh, the date that I was given for the, you know, the window of time that it happened. And it collided with a planet that was in that area and devastation unfolded and the asteroid belt was the result. They also suggested that a great chunk of Jupiter, which is a colossal planet, of course, um, broke off and careered through the solar system and devastated Mars. Interestingly, the probes to Mars have um, suggested that the landscape of Mars is no more than 10,000 years old. So something certainly happened there that devastated it and came close enough to the Earth and was caught in the Earth's field for a while, did a couple of orbits. And that orbit, when you look at the scientific um, suggestion of what that would have caused, starts to confirm some incredible um, legends, traditions, and uh, oral and written um, evidence from the ancient world all over the planet that there came what the Bible calls the Great Flood. One of the things that this would have done, this pass by what we now call Venus, is to have created a 10,000-foot uh, tidal wave. Interestingly, in the pre-flood world, since then, um, agriculture as we know it began at heights above 10,000 feet. Quite obvious why that would have happened in the scenario we're talking about. It is also suggested, and my other research in, in the book The Biggest Secret, it's detailed and documented in, in great detail, is that there was a Martian race which was the white race which actually came to the Earth and was interacting with the Earth, but as a result of the devastation and destruction of Mars, actually came here because it needed to survive. Uh, and this white Aryan Martian race based itself, and those that were here at the time of the cataclysm survived as a result of going into the high places um, in the Near East, what we now call Turkey, Caucasus Mountains, um, Iran, and that sort of area. And um, the amazing um, culture that appeared there, and I'll come to that in a second, was the result of this knowledge. This is um, uh, another map of uh, Europe and North America. Again, I'm talking about a cataclysm here, maybe about 4,800 B.C., but there have been many of them. When you look at the uh, geological and biological records, um, it's very clear this planet has had many cataclysms. Just talking about one. Earlier, around 13,000 years ago, there was clearly another. And that area, which they call Appalachia, um, 
which is now sea, was actually land in that window of 13,000 years ago. What we call the Alps, what we call the Himalayas and the Andes, those fantastic mountain ranges only reached anything like their present height around 13,000 years ago. So the Earth, while we've lived through quite a stable period in no human history, actually changes its face um, from time to time quite obviously because of various events. Um, Atlantis was supposed to have been one of the ancient cultures back in the ancient world which had this advanced knowledge and was destroyed by cataclysm. And again, this is a theme all over the world when you look at the ancient texts and oral traditions of this land of high technology, of high knowledge that was destroyed by cataclysm. And so once this, this cataclysm and cataclysms had unfolded over this period of time, 13,000 down to um, 7,000 years ago, that kind of window, a number of them, that great ancient civilization of knowledge, what the ancients called the Golden Age, was wiped from the face of the earth, and we started again. But we started again with different levels of knowledge. Among the survivors of these upheavals were the mass of the people who survived, um, or the representatives of them, who were still in ignorance. And then again, there were the few who had the knowledge. So it all started again. Same structure, and we've moved into the modern world where we're now at a point where we were um, a long, long time ago before these cataclysms wiped that civilization from the face of the earth. So what we're looking at here is the area that they concentrated on, where the white race actually came out of, interestingly. When they're talking about um, the Martian race being a white race and actually focusing in that area of the world, um, the Caucasus Mountains, uh, southern Russia, that area, Caucasus Mountains, down into what we now call Turkey and the, those areas around there, Iran. That's where the white race came from. The actually original name of Iran translates as land of the Aryans. When you look at the Hindu culture in the Indus Valley, which is one of these cultures, again, that spontaneously um, uh, emerged with advanced knowledge, um, even conventional history accepts that that culture, the Vedas and the structure of the Hindu religion, etc., was taken into the Indus Valley by an Aryan white race from the Caucasus Mountains. And when the floodwaters started to recede down from the high places, which could be the translation of Anunnaki, those who came from the high place, um, came down into the Indus Valley, into the um, plains and valleys of Sumer, and they created the Sumerian uh, culture, which um, is accepted again by conventional history, um, didn't start at this level and gradually evolve. It started at a very high level of advancement and then gradually fell away. Same with Egypt. It started at a very high level of advancement and then gradually fell away. Babylon, another one. And again, there are different uses of knowledge. And Babylon appears to have been a center for those who were in a state of being that wanted to use this knowledge to control because Babylon was where so much of the manipulation and control of today actually came out of. So, in short, we have an extraterrestrial race in that area interbreeding with humanity, creating hybrid bloodlines. Now, in The Biggest Secret, I go into this in much more detail, but it seems to me that along with this white Martian race was what um, UFO researchers have called a reptilian race. And um, the detail of that is documented there. And it's this reptilian race that also interbred with humanity. And I think the reptilian race were the Anunnaki. When the first interbreeding took place, the hybrids were half human, half Anunnaki, I think reptilian. And they interbred with this Martian race, this white race that became um, the race that took over the world in effect. When a second interbreeding took place, it wasn't between the Anunnaki reptilian race and the uh, humans, it was between the Anunnaki and their hybrid bloodstreams. So now we're going 75% Anunnaki reptilian, 25% human. These bloodlines, the, what I will call the, the pure bloodlines, the pure hybrids, these are the ones when you trace in, into the modern world that turned up as the pharaohs, as the ancient kings of Iran, the so-called serpent kings, 
that became the aristocracy of Europe, that became the royal families of Europe, and through the great British Empire became the presidents, business leaders, bankers of the United States. The reason that these families of the Eastern Establishment of the United States that produce the, the people that run America and the European aristocracy and royal families, the reason throughout history that they have obsessively interbred with each other and not outside is because they're trying to hold this genetic structure. This is a picture I took of um, a partial eclipse of the sun on a, a pyramid at Chichen Itza in uh, the Yucatan, a Maya pyramid. Um, and understanding the two levels of knowledge of the sun from the ancient world to today is to understand much about this manipulation and what's been happening in the world. On one level, the masses obviously focused on the sun because of its heat and warmth and its effect on their lives and their crops and all that stuff. But the few at the top of these pyramids of uh, control, the advanced race or races, if you like, they understood the much bigger nature of the sun. The fact that it is not just a source of heat and light, it is a fantastic generator of magnetic electrical energy which is affecting life on Earth second by second by second by second. And so, um, in summary, what you had here was a white Martian race which its hierarchy had this knowledge and this Anunnaki reptilian race, and you'd have to see the biggest secret for the enormous documentation of that being true, and they also had this knowledge. And below both, you had the mass of the people who didn't have this knowledge of the sun and much else. And a tussle took place between these two races, and eventually the reptilian race, through their bloodlines, took control and now control the world. So let's have a look at the, the nature of this knowledge of the sun. Um, what you're going to see now are sunspots. Great arcs of fantastic energy that are emitted from the sun in cycles. Sometimes they're very powerful, sometimes they're less powerful. And the sun is 99% of the mass of the solar system. When it changes, everything changes. And a great example of what I'm talking about and how it affects us and how the ancients knew about this is a guy called Maurice Cottrell. Earlier on in his life, he did a lot of research into sunspot activity, solar flare activity, these projections of energy from the sun, and he found that they could be put into various cycles, small cycles, medium cycles, great cycles over thousands of years. Later on in his life, he came across the Maya information left in Central America, the Yucatan, um, by the Maya people who picked it up from previous people, and again, you go back eventually to this extraterrestrial race, um, or races, emphasis on the races, and they have uh, put together a symbolic and mathematical structure that talks about cycles of human evolution, small cycles, medium cycles, great cycles. And Cottrell found, um, to his uh, surprise, that these Maya cycles of human evolution corresponded even over thousands of years in remarkable synchronicity with his cycles of sunspot activity, projections of energy from the sun. He also uh, looked at uh, the various historical cycles and found that the rise and the fall of great civilizations like the Roman Empire corresponded to these um, cycles of um, sun energy. So, when the sun changes, we change. We are encouraged at some points to be open to more aggression or more this or more that. Now, if you know that, and you know um, that at certain times the mass consciousness is more likely to react in a certain way, then you know, as you're manipulating the world, when to have your wars, when to have your economic collapses. And this is why, as many researchers, not just myself, have established that these events tend to happen in key years relating to sunspot and sun energy um, cycles. Therefore, in the ancient world, there was the knowledge of the sun in its true uh, importance, and its true effect, and then there was the mass of the people who just looked at it in a totally different way. And this is why um, in the cultures of the ancient world, you found, again, here a, a chair from Egypt, uh, thrown from Egypt, a Akhenaten chair, the pharaoh, 
sun. Gold, the solar color, the solar metal. This is why the obsession was with gold. Also, lions, you find a tremendous symbolism of the lion. The lion with its long mane symbolized the sun, which is why it was always there. Um, here again in uh, Sri Lanka, gold and the sun. Um, here in uh, Rome, the two lions, the sun and the disc, the sun. Again, understanding this. Now, here, much more recently, this is the sun chair of George Washington, first president of the United States. And the reason that you find the symbols of the ancient world used by this, this high advanced uh, level of knowledge in um, the more modern world right to the present day among the secret societies and among the countries in terms of flags and symbols, etc., is because the same knowledge stream is used today and the same uh, manipulation is used today as always was. Now this is a symbol that explains so much about religion and many of the symbols you see in the modern world. Because of the focus on the sun in its various levels of importance and understanding, this symbol was devised in the ancient world to symbolize the passage of the sun through the year. They did the circle with the zodiac um, zodiac coming from a Greek word meaning animal circle appropriately. They broke the circle into uh, four, the seasons, with the cross, and they put the sun on the cross. I've heard that somewhere before. So what they did is to um, focus their symbolism on this journey of the sun. This is why when you look pre-Christian, pre-Jesus, you find an endless stream of deities in the ancient world who were given birthdays of December the 25th. Why is that? Because um, around December 21st, 22nd, you have the lowest point in the sun cycle uh, in the year, in the northern, hem northern hemisphere anyway, um, which is the winter solstice. And at that point, the ancients said the sun had symbolically died. Three days later, the sun had demonstrably started its journey back to its peak in the summer. And at that point, December the 25th, they said the sun was born or born again. And because um, Christianity was created by, in the form we know it, by a sun-worshipping Roman emperor called Constantine the Great, that's why Jesus was given the birthday of December the 25th, symbolic of the sun, which is what Jesus is to a large extent. Uh, the evidence that he existed is like almost non-existent, if not non-existent in uh, total. So by Easter, uh, the sun was entering the sign of the ram or the lamb. And so they had ceremonies in which they sacrificed lambs in the pre-Christian world because they believed that by sacrificing the lamb to the gods, uh, they would have good luck and their sins would be forgiven and all that stuff. Now, this is where the symbolism of Jesus and so many uh, mirrors of Jesus in the pre-Christian world, that's why you, we, we constantly get this recurring story of um, uh, the Lamb who died so our sins could be forgiven. Now, what the ancients also did is they symbolized the sun as a baby um, at the December the 25th time as a kind of a youth at Easter and as a strapping, strong, immensely strong man um, in the height of the summer and losing his power in the fall, autumn, and then being an old man um, back towards the winter solstice. And they symbolize the sun as a person with long golden hair, just like the mane of the lion. And so this is where the Old Testament story of Samson comes from. Sam Sun. And what happened was they, they had him with long hair, big strapping man, the sun at the peak of the summer. And then what happened in the story, he started to lose his strength. And what, what happened to make him do that? He had his hair cut. The rays of the sun were getting less and less powerful as, they, as he entered the house of Delilah, Virgo the Virgin, which is the astrological sign as you're entering into the fall. And so... Um, so often, and again in The Biggest Secret, this is uh, documented constantly, this is why you get constant stories which we are asked in the masses to take literally, therefore a prison religion emerges when in fact they're symbolic, and often symbolic of the sun. So, 
this is what this is, the Celtic cross. It's the circle and the cross, the, the symbol I've just um, had on the screen. This is NATO. NATO is a wholly owned subsidiary um, of this brotherhood, this group of bloodlines, the reptile human bloodlines, the hybrids that run the planet. Again, this is the CIA symbol. Again, there's the cross with the sun on the cross. And this uh, sun symbolism is something that you can, you can read this brotherhood by. I, I came across this uh, shot or this uh, symbol in the city of London. Now, we'll get to this. The city of London is, is the operational epicenter of this global web of manipulation. And this is across the uh, road from St. Paul's Cathedral. And again, you see the same symbolism, and on the center you've got the black sun. Now, the black sun symbol symbolizes two things. It symbolizes the negative use of uh, solar energy, and it also symbolizes um, something that's becoming more and more uh, obvious, and people are becoming more aware of, and that's that it's not just the planets that go around the sun in the solar system. The solar system is also traveling around a central point. And that, cent that central point is known symbolically as the black sun, uh, kind of a galactic center. And it takes 26,000 years for the solar system to go around that sun. And we are now in the process of completing one of those 26,000 year cycles, which is why the world is changing and is going to change dramatically in the next uh, 15 years to 2012. So again, this symbol keeps coming up um, in the modern world as well as the ancient one. Now, even in the design of cities, which this brotherhood has in the uh, modern world controlled, you see exactly the same symbol. What you're looking at here is the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Paris, like Washington and London, is a mass of esoteric symbolism and sacred geometry built by design into the street plan. And so what you have is the Arc de Triomphe with the circle around it. There's the center of the, um, the sun on the cross, if you like. And going off from there are 12 uh, roads breaking up into the 12 segments, just like that symbol I showed you a few minutes ago. And um, this, again, is sun symbolism from the ancient world carried by this group. And even in the uh, road, on the road plan around the Arc de Triomphe, you see... Um, the sun there um, making the point. But if you don't realize where all this is coming from, it just seems like kind of nice design. Again, up there, um, Order of the Knights Templar in the York Rite of Freemasonry. That symbol there with the uh, cross and the crown is the way the symbol of the circle and the cross has been got into Christian churches without people realizing what it means. It's the same symbol, the cross and the circle. And... Again, you see the same symbol here. This is the uh, famous painting by Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was a very high initiate. In fact, he was the grand master of an uh, elite secret society, still very much uh, part of the manipulation today, called the Priory of Sion, S-I-O-N. And Sion comes from a Sanskrit word meaning the sun. The priory of the sun is what he's actually saying. And this guy was an initiate who, un who, who knew the underground story and the underground knowledge. This is why da Vinci was able to um, make predictions and draw pictures of, of various technologies that were well ahead of his time. Now, what he's done here is present the Last Supper picture in the form of symbolizing that same symbol, the cross and uh, the sun on the middle and the circle. He's depicted Jesus as the sun, hence the halo around his head there, and he's broken up the disciples into four sets of three, symbolizing the three-month periods uh, of the seasons and the sun going through them. This is why this constant recurring number of 12 and 1, the hero and the 12 followers, constantly reoccurs. This is why you have King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, the table, the circle of the Zodiac. This is why again and again, the big religious heroes had 12 followers, the sun and the months and the areas of the Zodiac. This is an ancient um, stone depiction of the Phoenician and many other uh, cultures within the Middle Near East 
but certainly the Phoenician sun god called Bel or Bill, who became the Canaanite Baal. And there you see the halo around the top of his head symbolizing the sun. And this is vastly ahead of the emergence of Christianity, which then used the halo because the same uh, symbolism was used because, again, is Zoroaster depicted with the, the halo and the rays around his head because these guys did not actually exist. They were symbols of the sun. That level of knowledge knows that this level of knowledge, the masses, takes the symbolic literal and you have a prison religion. So let's um, pick up how this all unfolded from here. Just to quickly summarize, in that area of what we now call Iran, Turkey and the Caucasus Mountains, you had two advanced races at the same time. You had the Martian race, which came down and uh, survived there and, and came out of there um, after the cataclysm involving Venus 7,000 years ago or so. But you also had um, another race, which the Sumerian text called the Anunnaki, a reptilian race. And they interbred in this uh, program or programs that are described in the Sumerian text. Um, and interestingly, they describe how this Anunnaki did this um, interbreeding by using what we would call test tube methods. Now, of course, when these tablets were found in 1850, the idea of creating life in test tubes, utterly ludicrous, no longer. And so you had the interbreeding between the white race, the Martian race, and the Anunnaki. And the outcome of that was what appeared to be a human form is what we'll call it today. But within that white race were particular bloodlines that were very, very reptilian. And again, you have to look in detail in The Biggest Secret to see the enormous documentation of this. But it's these bloodlines, this particularly the white reptilian, the Anunnaki Martian bloodlines that actually have run the world ever since. Demonstrably, the white race took the world over. They came out of the Caucasus Mountains and this area of the world in two basic ways. Go one way first, by land. They came out of the Caucasus Mountains. And incidentally, what do Americans call white people? Caucasian. Why do they call them after some mountains in the Near East? Because that's where the white race came from. They came across land into Europe and they changed their names. They were the Scythians, they were the Sumerians, they were many different names. And if you follow the movement of people, you find that they became the white race of Europe. They became the Anglo-Saxon race because the Angles and the Saxons were simply different names for the same race. They became the Scandinavian peoples, they became the British, and they became the French. They became the European white race. And within this white race were these Anunnaki bloodlines, these reptilian bloodlines. And these were the ones, when you do the research and the genealogy, that ended up again and again and again in the positions of power. Uh, political, royal, uh, economic, all of it. And so, um, not only did they come across land in that way, much earlier, around 3000 BC, through a white race called the Phoenicians, they went by sea to Britain. And what we call the British culture, which of course has, has, has had such an effect on passing on that culture to the rest of the world, is actually the Phoenician culture. It comes from the Near East. And the proof of that is endless in the artifacts and the legends and the stories that have been uh, left. For instance, what you see there um, in that depiction on the coin, a ancient coin, is a Phoenician goddess called Bharati. And on the other side, you see the classic depiction by the British of their goddess, Britannia. And they are the same, because Britannia was Bharati. The Phoenicians uh, worshipped uh, two uh, deities. One was the male, Barat, one was the female, Barati. And she became Britannia, and Barat and Barati became Baritan, 
and the British. The British culture is, in effect, the Phoenician culture. Not only that, when you look at the names given to the goddesses and what have you, or in the Indus Valley, what we call the Hindu culture, they are the same. They are very, very close to the name Bharat and Bharati because this white race, as I said earlier, also went in and created the Indus Valley Hindu culture. No accident that all the major religions in the world that prisoners came out of this same area of the Middle and Near East. In Britain are white horses scored into the hillside. This is the, supposed to be the oldest one. It's a place called Uffington in Wiltshire. And it's been dated to around 3000 BC. That is precisely the time the Phoenicians arrived by sea into Britain, bringing the Bharati, British culture as it became. Now, why would the Phoenicians score horses in the hillsides, the chalk hillsides of Britain? Very simple. The Phoenicians were sun worshippers. This was a Phoenician symbol of the sun. Um, this is a Phoenician uh, high priestess. Again, you see the swastika. The swastika was a Phoenician symbol of the sun. Quite a positive symbol. And what the Nazis did, because they understood this, is they turned it round to indicate the negative because they understood the uh, nature of the sun as well. This is a Phoenician stone found in Britain. There again, you see the um, swastika. And what we call the British culture came from the Near East. Another thing that these advanced people within the Phoenician culture uh, understood was the fact that the earth uh, has uh, through it and around it uh, what is known as an energy grid or grids. These are force lines of energy. Some people call them ley lines, some people call them dragon lines in China, meridians, whatever. Where these lines of force cross, you create a vortex. Where many of these lines cross, you create a colossal vortex. And therefore, you have enormous energy which you can use to create and do various things. This guy um, was an Englishman in a place called Herefordshire. And one day, he was on his horse at the top of a hillside, and he suddenly looked down into the valley and saw these lines in a sort of psychic way all over the place, straight lines, and they connected the sacred wells, the sacred places of worship, the points where the churches were built, the, the hillsides, etc. And this now, as we have moved on, has been um, confirmed by the scientific world, those with an open mind anyway, um, that this grid line, uh, grid system actually exists like a, like a web around the world. Now, where these ley lines cross, in their most powerful way, where most of them cross, just happens to correspond with where the ancients had their most sacred ceremonies and their most sacred places. Stonehenge and places like that were built on them. So where the lines come in and the vortex is created, that is where they built the Stonehenges. The Avebris, another stone circle and um, energy complex in Britain. That's where they built... Uh, all over the world, they're temples to access this energy. This is Avebury in Wiltshire. Now, this is interesting. I used to live near here. And the Phoenicians built this with their knowledge. Now, the Phoenicians, I would suggest, and the evidence is presented in The Biggest Secret, were originally a Martian race. What people like uh, Richard Hoagland have found, who's investigated um, the Cydonia region of Mars, where they've found pyramids, etc., and other uh, non-natural creations, is that if you look at the way that the various pyramids and non-natural um, points relate to each other in this area of Mars called Cydonia, and then you place them over Avebury in Wiltshire, England, they fit almost exactly. Avebury appears to be a mirror of Cydonia on Mars. Also, when you, when you look at the, um, the background, there's very strong evidence that the pyramids in uh, Egypt were built around 3000 BC. 
the very time these things were going up. And they built pyramids. What have they found on Mars? Pyramids. Also, as some scientific research has uh, shown, when you put people in white bodies into sensory deprivation tanks, their natural rhythm is not the rhythm of the uh, orbit of the Earth, it is the rhythm of the orbit of Mars. And a scientist friend of mine said to me once, when I, after I first met him, he said, uh, you know, um, there's a point in the world where on one of these magnetic grids systems called the Hartman grid, 12 of these meridian lines cross at the same point and go down in the earth. Amazing place. I said, where's that? He said, place called Avebury in England. The ancients knew this. This is Silbury Hill, the biggest man-made um, mound in Europe, right next to Avebury. Um, this is Stonehenge. It's one of the crop circles down the bottom there, or the crop formations. 125 circles, I think, there is in that. These ancients, coming from this advanced knowledge, this is Tara in Ireland, all over um, this area of, of Britain. This is uh, Glastonbury Tor, not too far from Avebury and Stonehenge. And then you come to the pyramids of Central America, the Yucatan. Why is the basic culture and the stories and the beliefs and the building methods of Central America, South America, the same as Europe. Because when uh, you follow this research, you find that the Phoenicians not only went to Britain in the ancient world, they crossed the Atlantic also. Phoenician artifacts have been found in Brazil, for instance. And uh, what could well be Egyptian, certainly Egyptian or Oriental artifacts, have been found in the Grand Canyon. The reason that the, the stories and the beliefs are so similar, almost exactly the same, in the American continent as the European continent, when they weren't supposed to have met, is because it was taken from um, across the Atlantic into the Americas by this white race. Um, Babylon, I mentioned earlier, was very important. It was in Babylon that, that a large number of these reptilian human, reptilian Martian, whatever you want to call them, uh, reptilian white bloodlines um, focus themselves. And in Babylon, they created the structure which can be found in every religion because they understood if you got a certain structure and called it a religion, you could imprison the human mind. And so when you look at the religious belief and structure and stories of ancient Babylon, you're looking at the ancient stories that followed. For instance, where have you heard this before? Nimrod, the father and Tammuz, the son, were the same. Father, son. And then you had Queen Semiramis, who was the mother, the virgin mother, of Tammuz. So, in Babylon, vastly uh, before Christianity, you had Nimrod, Tammuz, Semiramis. Father, mother, son. The Trinity. And... Nimrod was symbolized in many different ways. And one of the ways he was symbolized was as the, um, the eagle looking both ways. And what you're looking at there is a symbol of modern Freemasonry. The, the uh, symbols of the modern secret societies that control the world to this minute are the symbols of ancient Babylon and this period where it all, uh, this era of the world where it all came out of. Incidentally, another aspect of Nimrod um, died with a lamb at his feet, was put into a tomb, and when after three days they pulled the stone back, there was no one there. I think I've heard that somewhere before too. This is another sun god who didn't um, exist called Mithra. In Persia, Rome, and in Mithra, artifacts have been found even in Britain. And what did they say about this guy, Mithra? He was born on December the 25th. He was born to a virgin mother. Um, he died so our sins could be forgiven. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh to his birth. Um, and that um, uh, they called him the vine. They called him the Lord, the shepherd. All the things you see in the New Testament, you see said about Mithra. And where the Roman uh, Catholic center is now, the Vatican, on that site, they found a uh, Mithra artifact because it was a place of Mithra worship. And Mithra ran right up into the Jesus period, and they basically changed the name of Mithra to Jesus, and we had another religion. 
what they said about Jesus on the right there and what they said about Horus, the son of God of ancient Egypt, was identical. Because uh, Nimrod, Tamos, Semiramis in Babylon, when these reptile human bloodlines took over the culture of uh, Egypt, which had been started by the white race, the uh, Phoenicians, they just transferred the same story and called it different names. So Nimrod, Tamos, Semiramis in Babylon became Osiris, Isis, and uh, Horus in Egypt. And again, right across the world, in different cultures and different eras, you see different names for the same deities. There seems to be a mass of names, very confusing. In fact, they're different names for the same deities. The cross is supposed to be a Christian symbol. It's not. It goes back as far as history goes back. This is a, a, a standing stone with a cross. Here we have um, Mother Mary holding Jesus, except that we don't. This is how the Egyptians uh, symbolized Isis holding Horus. And again, in my book, The Biggest Secret, you'll see um, massive documentation of how this story just goes on being repeated. The initiates know what it means, the brotherhood, um, the mass of the people are asked to take it literally. What actually turned Christianity into the religion it became and who decided what Christians believe to this day was a Roman emperor called Constantine the Great. Um, in 325 AD, um, he called a meeting um, of bishops in the early Christian church uh, to his palace at Nicaea, now Iznik in northwest Turkey, and there the Nicene Creed was created. After they'd had a punch up and ripped up documents and all that stuff, um, they decided the Nicene Creed uh, would be um, as it is to this very day, and that's what Christians uh, are supposed to believe. Um, in this sign, you will conquer. Um, what um, Constantine said, and he was a sun worshipper. He worshipped a uh, deity called Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun, and Mithra, and all this stuff. He had no problem with Jesus because it was just a different name he believed for what he was already believing anyway. Um, and um, what he said was that before a battle, when he was battling to become emperor, he saw a cross in the sky um, from Jesus saying, um, by this sign or in this sign you will conquer in the battle, which is, sounds massively like what the Prince of Peace would say, doesn't it, really? So Christianity was a manufactured religion. Here we see um, the Pope... Uh, there's the Maltese cross, um, a, a brotherhood symbol that you can see to the present day. I'll come to that shortly. But on the Pope's head is the mitre. And if you look at it sideways on, it's actually a fish head. Why is it a fish head? Because that's the symbol of Nimrod, the Babylonian uh, god figure, uh, who they symbolized as a fish as they symbolized his partner, Samiramis, as a dove. And this is where the fish comes from in Christianity, um, as well as the uh, house of Pisces. So basically, and the biggest secret documents this in detail, the Babylonian uh, group moved home to Rome, the new Babylon. Now also in this story, if we uh, move forward to the time of the Crusades in the 1100s, 1200s, um, you find that in the Middle East at that time, a series of knights organizations that suddenly appeared, which are still going today, and among their members today are some of the top people in global politics, business, banking, military, media, etc. They were the Teutonic Knights, which relate to Germany. They were the Knights Hospitaller of St. John of Jerusalem. And St. John, incidentally, um, is a symbol of Nimrod, for reasons the biggest secret explains. And the other one, which I'm going to concentrate on for a few minutes, was the Knights Templar. And they all appeared around Jerusalem at the time of the Crusades. And the Knights Templar um, said that they'd created this organization originally to protect pilgrims who were visiting the Holy Land. Well, there's only nine of these fellas for nine years, which is going to protect a massive amount of pilgrims, clearly. Um, after they'd parked themselves in Jerusalem, right next to what we now call Temple Mount, the so-called um, scene of Solomon's temple. But when you look at the background of Solomon, there is no evidence he existed outside the Old Testament, and every syllable of Solomon means the sun, another symbol. Anyway, after nine years um, in the Jerusalem area, 
next to the Temple Mount, suddenly things started to move very rapidly for the Templars. Some of them went back to Europe and they started signing up the noble families of Europe and to particularly France to start with. And to join the Templars, you had to give them all your wealth. So they became massively wealthy very, very, very quickly. Um, and they, they created um, two basic financial centers in their empire. One was in Paris, one was in London. Today, Paris and London are the two key centers of the operational level of the manipulation of the world. No coincidence. Um, after a while, however, um, the king of France, Philip the Fair, um, who was up to his neck in debt to the Templars, decided that he was going to remove them. Now, this thing about debt's very important. You can follow through these bloodlines out of the Middle East, these reptilian human bloodlines that became the European aristocracy, etc. A number of themes that keep reoccurring. Um, one is creating prison religions based on the basically same story, to keep masses in ignorance. Two is satanic ritual and blood drinking and such human sacrifice ceremonies, which are still going on today to the same deities they did in the ancient world. And thirdly, the scam where you um, lend money that doesn't exist to uh, the population and charge them interest on it, which is what happens to this very day, of course. The debt we call debt in the world is actually debt that doesn't exist. It's just figures on a screen. No, there's no money involved at all. It's just a, a thought form. So... What happened with the Templars is that they played this scam because they were part of this stream and uh, they got the crown heads of Europe up to their neck in debt to them, just as their successors have the governments of the world today in debt to them. So Philip the Fair wanted to bring an end to this and there's more to that story um, as well. And on Friday the 13th, in October 1307, he issued orders, supposedly secret orders, to arrest the Templars on that morning. That's why Friday the 13th has been de deemed um, unlucky ever since. Now, he got some of the Templars, but he didn't get most of them. They got away and they went in three basic directions. One, they crossed the Atlantic to the Americas, and two other directions. First of all, they went off from their port at La Rochelle in France with the loot, because when Philip the Fair went to get the loot, from the Templars in their headquarters in Paris, it had all gone. And they went in their ships, one group of them, around the outside, the west coast of Ireland, and into Scotland. And there's a reason they did that, two reasons, in fact. First of all, uh, Philip the Fair enlisted the support of the Pope to purge the Templars. Uh, but Scotland, with, uh, with Robert the Bruce, etc., was um, in conflict with the Pope at the time. And therefore, excommunicated, and therefore, the destroy the Templars order didn't apply in Scotland at that time. And also, a tremendous number of these bloodline families out of the Near East, this, these reptile human bloodlines, came out of northern France and Belgium, what we call that area now anyway, and went into Scotland um, almost en masse. Within 150 years, these bloodlines were running Scotland, and they have the names today that we think are Scottish. We go, Hamilton, Orkai, and McDougal, Orkai, Scottish? No, no. They came out of that area of northern France and Belgium. Um, and they were the same bloodlines. Robert the Bruce was one of them um, that the Templars were connected to. So the Templars went into friendly territory. And they went underground because of the purge, and they re-emerged eventually as the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. This is why the biggest secret society in the world today that pervades world politics, business, banking, uh, the media, etc., um, is called the Scottish Rite, after this tiny country at the top of the British Isles, because that's where the Templars went um, when uh, the purge happened. This is a uh, Knights Templar. You'll see the red cross on the white background. That was the Phoenician uh, fire cross or sun cross. And this is why the flag of England is a red cross on the white background. It's also why you had the Red Cross organization, which is also linked to this network at the highest level. Now, here's the flag of England. It's called St. the St. George's Cross. Now, two big British deities were St. George, who killed the dragon, and the more I research this, the more I feel that is symbolic of this battle between these Martian, uh, this Martian white race and this Anunnaki reptilian race, because the dragon was very much used to symbolize this serpent race in the ancient world. 
Uh, and so St. George is not actually a British deity, it's actually Phoenician, because that's where the Phoenicians went, to Britain. St. Michael, which is a great Christian deity, was an ancient Phoenician deity also. And areas of Europe, like called St. Michael's Mount, uh, one, in, um, one in England, southern England, came from uh, the Phoenicians who settled that area. Now, the uh, Templars then moved out of France, around into Scotland, and that was one area they went. They went across to um, the Americas, and they also went down to Portugal. Now, before I get into that, just let me just show you one thing um, in Scotland, which confirms so much of um, the fact the Templars were there, and there, indeed there are many artifacts to prove it, and, and other evidence. And that's this place, Rosslyn Chapel, in uh, just south of Edinburgh it is, the... Uh, great city on the uh, east coast of Scotland. And this was built on the land of the St. Clair family. Now, the St. Clair family were a French bloodline going back to the Near East that went to Scotland and became the Sinclair family, that classic Scottish name, Sinclair. And this is one of the great holy grails of the, uh, the brotherhood today, um, the Rosslyn Chapel. Now, in the stonework of Rosslyn Chapel, you see um, sweet corn plants, aloe plants, and cactus plants, etc., that at the time this was built were only found in America. Perhaps still are, I don't know, but certainly then. Which is remarkable because this was built before Columbus left on his journey to discover America. In other words, they'd been long before, they just didn't want us to know it. So, as they went to Scotland, so another group of Templars came down to Portugal, which will connect into America now as we start to enter the modern world. They hid behind an organization called the Knights of Christ, the Knights Templar under another name, and they were a maritime organization because the Templars had a massive fleet of ships. And actually they flew on their ships the flag of the skull and bones, um, which is become known as the pirate's flag. It was the Templar flag, which is why the skull and bones is still a symbol today of this brotherhood. And one of the grand masters of this Knights of Christ, the Templars under another name, was a guy called Prince Henry the Navigator. And he had access to maps of the world that the general population never had because of this pyramid, knowledge, ignorance. This is significant because the father-in-law of Christopher Columbus was a sea captain close to Prince Henry the Navigator. So Columbus was not... Um, looking for India when he found the Americas, he knew basically where he was going because the maps already existed. Because this unfolding agenda has a time scale, not least through the sun cycles, etc., um, it means that although they knew the Americas existed, the point had come in the agenda where it had to be officially discovered and therefore occupied by the European uh, races. Now, Christopher Columbus, his name wasn't actually Columbus, his name was Colon. Um, why did they call him Columbus? Because in the various, not just religious, but other historical texts, you see the codes and the code names that um, the initiates would understand that the general population do not. I, I mentioned a few minutes ago that the symbol for Nimrod was the fish and the symbol for Queen Semiramis was the dove. Columbus means dove. In French today, Colombe actually still means dove. And the Romans in the Roman Empire worshipped a deity called Venus Columba, Venus the dove. Both Venus and the dove were symbols of Queen Semiramis, this deity. So that's where he got his name, uh, Columbus. But there's more actually to, to um, look at in terms of this. Because four or five years after Columbus found that part of the Americas, down the Caribbean, etc., Another guy left Bristol, England. And Bristol comes from Barati. That's where the name evolved from, the Phoenician deity. His name was John Cabot. And he discovered what we now call North America. Conventional history has not put Columbus and Cabot together, but you can do, not least through the research of a Freemasonic historian of uh, great reputation called Manley P. Hall, who points out that uh, Columbus and Cabot both operated in Genoa at the same time and both were connected to the same secret society network. And within 
a few years, four or five years of each other, one finds one part of the Americas, the other finds another part of the Americas. Just a coincidence, nothing to worry about. What was actually happening was the time scale had come to take over America, and it moved on after that. So Columbus was a front man and a knowing one. There's one other group that came out of this Near East, which it is vital to talk about. And it relates actually to Columbus too. We've seen how one group of peoples moved by land across from that Caucasus, Turkey, Iran area, and um, across to become the white races of Europe. We've seen how the Phoenicians went to Britain much earlier than that, 3000 BC. But there was another group which came out of the Middle Near East and parked themselves in Venice in northern Italy. And these Phoenicians became the Venetians. And they created a maritime, because they were a maritime uh, nation, the Phoenicians, and financial empire out of Venice. And that financial empire was based on lending people money that didn't exist and charging interest on it and funding both sides in wars. Now, within these white Phoenician bloodlines, yet again, were these reptilian bloodlines, uh, these Anunnaki bloodlines. And again, you'll have to refer to the biggest secret to see the enormous evidence that this stuff about the Anunnaki and the reptilians is correct. While they were in Venice, this group of Phoenicians Anunnaki became known as the black nobility because they started... Um, creating titles for themselves and taking over titles that already existed. And they got this nickname, the Black Nobility. Now, some of the so-called um, Jewish banking names of the world today, like the Warburgs, are not actually Jewish at all, because they came out of this group in Venice. The Warburgs, who were fundamental in creating the Federal Reserve, the so-called Central Bank of America, which is privately owned from people in Europe, um, the Warburgs were called the Abraham Del Banco family in Venice, and they became the Warburgs when they moved up into Germany and Europe. So eventually, this black nobility um, in Venice moved north through Germany and centered themselves in Amsterdam. In 1688, one of this black nobility called William of Orange was manipulated onto the throne of England as William III. With that, this whole shebang moved across and created its epicenter in London. So at that point, those bloodlines that had gone much earlier through the Phoenicians into Britain and those that had come across land and also through Venice actually came together in London. It was William of Orange, a few years after he became king, who signed the charter that created the Bank of England and the banking, central banking system uh, was created. It was after that time that the City of London Financial District became the center of global finance. And it was after that time that we got the great British Empire when these bloodlines were expanded from Britain all over the world to Africa, to Australia, to Asia. Um, to the Americas. And what started out in Babylon and the Near East and moved outwards now went global because of the British Empire. People say that um, because the British Empire and these European empires have actually contracted since then that it can't be true that the world's still controlled from London and these cities. But there's two ways of controlling people. One has a finite life. One can go on forever until someone exposes it. The first one is overt, in-your-face control. The dictatorship, where Britain controls this country and controls that country. The people in that country know where they are. They're controlled by an outside force, like the, the Russians during communism and the Germans during uh, Hitler. That has a finite life because eventually, when you know where you stand, you're going to rebel against that control much more subtle to replace that overt control with covert control, where people are controlled, but they don't know that they're controlled. People don't rebel about the fact that they're not free if they think they are. So what happened as the contraction came of these empires, not least the British Empire, is while on the surface it seemed to be over, left outside in those countries, back in those countries, were the bloodlines and the secret society network which has continued to control those countries from this point on. Because what happened 
in that ancient time is that you had the positive use of knowledge and they created mystery schools and secret societies in Egypt and elsewhere to pass this advanced knowledge on in a positive way. They, you then had this other force, largely out of Babylon, that also created mystery schools and secret societies for very different reasons. To pass on the advanced knowledge only to um, the chosen ones that they chose, and they created the institutions, these same secret societies, in the public arena that sucked that advanced knowledge out of circulation. Not least the Inquisition, when, I mean, two minutes into this video, I would have signed a suicide note during the Inquisition. So therefore, um, you had uh, a situation in which the knowledge was passed on to the few and the institutions created by that secret society network to suck it out of public circulation. Eventually, and people like Manley P. Hall have documented this, that negative use of knowledge, that negative structure of mystery schools and secret societies also infiltrated eventually and took over the positive mystery schools and secret societies. So we reached a point eventually where knowledge was passed on only to the few at the highest level who had a malevolent intent and it was sucked out of the public arena big time. So the structure today is basically this. The epicenter and operational level is in London. That's where the global agenda is decided. And in these different countries like, the, like America, the United States, uh, South Africa, etc., you have bloodline branch managers, as I call them, who run those particular countries in line with the centrally decided and coordinated agenda. In South Africa, you've got the Oppenheimer family, who are the bloodline controllers of South Africa before and after Mandela, control the stock market, the diamond mines, and the... Um, gold mines and the other industries and the media. In America, the bloodline branch managers are the Rockefellers and the cartel of the Eastern establishment who get their orders from the centrally coordinated epicenter in London and Paris, particularly London, and they run America in line with that. So wherever I go, in the 20 odd countries I've talked in and researched in so far, the same policies, the same structures exist because they're coming from a central point. Um, and the world is controlled, therefore, by a very, very few people. One of the bloodlines centered in London are the Windsors. In The Biggest Secret, I expose some stunning, breathtaking uh, information about the real nature of the Windsors and the bloodlines. These are black nobility bloodlines who go back um, through this story that I've been talking about, and that's why they have so much power and so much wealth and so much influence because they're meant to, but not for long. Now this is Ben. Everyone knows that the founding fathers believed in freedom in America. Well, some of them might have done, but some of them didn't. Because what happened in 1776 and afterwards when America to this day believed it was becoming an independent nation and free, what happened was that overt control of the Americas through the colonies was replaced by covert control. America has never been free of Britain's uh, influence and control to this very day, and it's about time it was. And people like Benjamin Franklin, and I document this in detail in The Biggest Secret, were agents of British intelligence and the British Crown. This guy was parked in Paris as an ambassador in Paris, and he spent tremendous amounts of time in London. More than that, I said earlier that uh, one of the common themes of these bloodlines uh, through history is blood drinking, satanic ceremonies, etc., etc., human sacrifice. That's what this guy was into. He was the, one of the top Freemasons in America. He was uh, a member of a key Freemasonic uh, lodges in France, which created the French Revolution, like the Nine Sisters Lodge. And he was a member of a really elite secret society and satanic uh, human sacrificing blood drinking operation in Britain called the Hellfire Club, run by a British government minister called Sir Francis Dashwood, um, and who built um, underground chambers in his uh, estate at Wickham, north of London, to do the sacrificing and stuff. Uh, that may sound amazing, uh, but um, just a little while ago in uh, the British newspapers, this story broke. Um, Again, while uh, Benjamin Franklin was fighting for freedom uh, for the American colonies, he parked his bum in London. 
and he lived in a place called 36 Craven Street near Trafalgar Square. Well, they've just um, been renovating that to turn it into a Benjamin Franklin Museum, and bingo, they found ten bodies underneath uh, the floor, six of them children, and they've uh, dated them to the time Benjamin Franklin lived there. They've said, oh, he must have been into body snatching. When you link it to his other activities, I think there's probably another explanation. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, again, one of the aristocratic bloodlines from Europe, um, and uh, a guy who was a member of the Rosicrucian secret society and other esoteric uh, secret societies that carried this knowledge. He just didn't tell anyone else about it. He also owned 200 slaves, Thomas Jefferson, while writing that every man is created equal. Um, slight contradiction there, I feel. Maybe we're all equal unless you've got a black face. Um, and so when you look at the, the presidents from the very start, this is George Washington. Again, another of the aristocratic bloodlines from Europe that became presidents of the United States. And um, when I'm talking about these same bloodlines um, taking over Europe and then through the British Empire taking over America and, and, and other countries, um, I'm not kidding. When you do the genealogical research, you find some remarkable statistics. Um, since George Washington became president in 1789, and including him, every single American presidential election has been won by the candidate with the most British and European royal genes. And that comes from Burke's Peerage, the Bible of aristocratic genealogy on the planet, based in Britain. We've had, at the time that I'm speaking these words, 42 American presidents. 33 of them are genetically related to England's Alfred the Great and Charlemagne, the most uh, famous monarch of uh, France uh, way back. He became uh, monarch for the Holy Roman Empire. Of the uh, 42 presidents, 19 have been genetically related to um, England's King Edward III, who has thousands of blood connections to Prince Charles. And then you look at Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton's a kid from Arkansas, we all know that. Not connected to any bloodlines, just a kid off the street, made good, because anyone can become president in America. I, I know, I read it somewhere. Clinton is genetically related to the House of Windsor, to every Scottish monarch, to uh, King Henry III of England, and to King Robert I of France. And this is why, because of his bloodline, that he was taken at a very early age and given uh, this scholarship to uh, Oxford University called a Rhodes Scholarship, which is given to bloodline people in um, the world to go and be indoctrinated into this um, agenda um, in Britain. And then they come back and the ratio of them that become presidents or people in power behind the scenes in their countries is absolutely vast. It's because of their bloodline. There's a number of symbols which you can pick up because there's a secret language of this brotherhood, again, that comes out of Babylon. And as, as the time has gone on, the malevolent use of this advanced knowledge through this, uh, what you might call Babylon brotherhood that emerged on a global level as it is today, um, has become the dominating force on the planet, um, interacting, as I talk about in detail in The Biggest Secret, with this Anunnaki um, extraterrestrial force or race. Um, one of the symbols is the pyramid, and particularly the pyramid with the capstone missing, the pyramid and all-seeing eye. This was um, put on the dollar bill in 1933-34 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, another of the bloodlines who goes back to French aristocracy, um, which connects in with the British. And the um, symbol you're looking at was actually the symbol of a secret society called the Bavarian Illuminati, which was behind the French Revolution, and it goes much further back than that. Um, so the, the obsession with symbolism and other re for other reasons certain symbols is phenomenal. People asked a few years ago during the presidency in France of Francois Mitterrand, why on earth did they put this big black pyramid, this glass black pyramid, next to the beautiful Louvre Museum? People can understand it for, because from an ascetic point of view it was ludicrous. But they built pyramids in Egypt to interact with the energy and to create a particular energy field. They did the same on Mars, it would seem, also. And they're doing the same in the modern world in the street plans. This is why, and we'll see this as uh, this talk unfolds, why that pyramid was put there. And anyone know where that is? Many people in America will. It's Dealey Plaza. This is where they killed Kennedy 
in Dealey Plaza and the street plan of Dealey Plaza where the first uh, Freemasonic temple in um, Dallas was put um, is a pyramid with the capstone missing. They killed uh, Kennedy on the right hand side, the grassy knoll near the number five there and down the bottom of the pyramid in an underground car park is where they killed Lee Harvey Oswald who was falsely accused of doing the deed but you need someone to blame when you don't want people to know what really happened. Um, and We'll see as this unfolds, and we'll talk about the Diana situation and, and her murder in Paris, the obsession with ritual and symbols um, is unbelievable, and it's one way of reading this brotherhood. The key brotherhood signature is the lighted torch. This comes from an ancient um, legend which goes back to the Watchers or Anunnaki, the extraterrestrials. They were also called the Watchers in some ancient texts. Um, and the legend was that some of these watchers gave knowledge to humanity or a certain section of humanity. And a number of deities have been um, invented in the various different cultures like ancient Greece, etc. to symbolize the same story of the gods giving knowledge to certain numbers of humans. The most famous of these is this guy, Prometheus the Greek god who was supposed to have come from the Caucasus Mountains and he's holding, as you see, the flame. The flame is symbolic of knowledge, the sun, the illuminated ones. The Illuminati is one name for this brotherhood. The illuminated ones, those illuminated into this advanced knowledge. And so what you're looking at is a gold depiction of Prometheus um, in the Rockefeller Center in New York, put there by the Rockefellers, and there's a plaque to, to show that, because they, one of the bloodline families running America on behalf of the London Central Elite, um, they know the symbolism of Prometheus. And so the lighted torch or the flame became the key signature of this brotherhood, and you can follow it. That's what this is. Uh, this is a, an exact replica of the um, Statue of Liberty in Las Vegas. That's why you've got the fairground ride behind but what you're looking at is the lighted torch the sun knowledge the illuminated ones the illuminati the brotherhood also around the head you see the rays of the sun now that's classic queen samiramis symbolism that's who, that's basically queen samiramis of babylon and because of this difference between those in the knowledge the few and the masses who are not People look in America and around the world at that in New York Harbor and they say, oh yeah, that's symbolizing the land of the free. No, no. It's symbolizing the opposite. It's saying, look, we run the show and we're telling you and you haven't even got a clue. And this is not actually new at all. This was given um, in, 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 in terms of America. This was given the Statue of Liberty to New York by French Freemasons who were in the underground stream of knowledge of what it represented. And in Paris to this day, in an island on the River Seine, there's the Eiffel Tower in the background, there is the French uh, Statue of Liberty in the same way. Because again, it symbolizes something to this brotherhood which the masses don't understand. When they killed Kennedy in Dealey Plaza, there's the grassy knoll over on the right there. Afterwards, they put in Dealey Plaza an obelisk, which is a Freemasonic symbol relating to the sun, the phallic symbol, the male energy. Again, goes back to ancient Egypt, etc. And at the top of that, after they killed Kennedy, they put a depiction of the lighted torch. Because that is the Illuminati Brotherhood. Um, signature saying we kill Kennedy and we're telling you and you don't even see it. What did they put on Kennedy's grave to this day? The lighted torch. They call it the eternal frame but it's their signature saying we kill Kennedy and we're telling you and you're not even bright enough to see it but of course if you don't understand the, the, the story we're not being told how can you see it? It just seems like the eternal flame, a positive thing. It's not. This is Paris. There's the Eiffel Tower. That is an exact replica put there in the late 80s um, um, of the torch held by both the French and the American Statue of Liberty. What is that? Where is that? That stands on top of the Pont d'Alma Tunnel in Paris almost on the spot underneath where Diana was killed in the car crash. Um, and that has become the shrine, if you see the flowers there, to Diana exactly as planned. And what have they put on the island where they, they buried her, um, or claimed to have done? 
at Althorpe Park in Northamptonshire in England, um, on the Spencer Estate, they put the lighted torch, the signature, we did it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. There we go on the, um, the dime, the lighted torch, the Illuminati. What they also do is 